I have a very special guest called Maxwell Lewis Latham, or just, just Max Latham. Latham. You are a, a, Latham, you are a gem in the scene and uh, a very fascinating guy. So I guess the first question is, uh, how do you feel about getting your bottom smacked recently? <laughs> well, like you said, Bill, big boy, Bill, bad boy, uh, Bill Broughton, I managed to piss off more people in the hermetic community in the space of a single day than than you did in three years. And you you don't really give two hoots, and neither do I. And, you know, some people can take a joke, other people can't. And for me, it was just a bit of fun. But, yeah, let's get past it. We're all friends. And uh, hopefully we can, you know, move on from this. Absolutely, my friend. And you see, um, we've all made mistakes. And we are... Most of us engaged in a process whereby we learn to manage our reactions. And um, but obviously a little bit of leeway on both sides. Obviously, we've all we've all screwed up from time to time. But I think it's important that um, <clears throat> unless it's life and death, you just stay calm, you smile. It's all good. You need that confidence in the future. And, and let's face it, you don't get parodied unless you've made some kind of impact. So I just see it as a compliment. I got into an argument with a French geezer, lovely bloke, lovely bloke, used to be a Buddhist, lived in Tibet for years, and then he fell in with some communists in Maoists in Paris, and that sort of smashed the spirituality out of him. And we used to have these massive, heated conversations. And he's a lovely bloke. He was an anarcho communitarist and he was bringing people in who were all kinds of people, mainly artists, or poets, musicians, people that are painters, sculptors, and... He had this whole little community out in the mountains near Switzerland. And anyway, he told me, he goes, sir, the French won the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. I said, fuck off, mate. But the thing is that um, when you're out there, and you'll know this yourself because you haven't lived an easy life. And even now, this is like four years out there in the wilderness. But it's oh, kind of like... Four, four winters I've done. So it's about three and a half years I've lived on the road here. Well, I did yeah. 15, and it's like sometimes you'll be walking along in the mountains in the middle of nowhere, and there's just like nothing but like kind of lynxes and wolves and occasionally the odd bear and deer and eagles and stuff. And then you come across like a waterfall, and you want to meditate next to it. And it's so beautiful, so beautiful that I would be reduced to tears of joy at how wonderful creation is and i think we've lost that we all live in these little houses now most of us do um and when you're out there among it all day you'll see the sun come up most people are in bed still when that happens and to see the sun set or to see the sun rise and just appreciate the the glory of mother nature nature or hertha as tacitus calls it is a really spiritual experience and it brings you a lot closer and I think that's the reason why I was able to go out of body. Uh, yeah, it's. It, I'll be honest, it hasn't been fun. And there is a strange blessing here, um, sort of honing in on this idea of blessings in faults. You see, I wouldn't have chosen it, but it is the perfect training. And, um, you know, obviously, the, you know, ups and downs, no pun intended with the, you know, the ladder. And that, but uh, you know, there have been times where I'll be honest. I'll be I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. Mm. I will say for for all the um, for all the snobbery that I've encountered, I've I've also had this. Uh, put it this way: when you're not walking around in a suit and tie, you you find these little gems here and there. You know, it might be a girl who works in the bakery or. One of my customers, a guy called Ian, who whenever I need to go to London, he lets me park my van on his drive. You make these friends, these special people, these people that see through the uh, the standard appearances, the, the standard sign of success, if you like. So I get up at six and I go running. And I used to grow up by the beach in a lovely area. It's a bit like cross between Lord of the Rings and the Darling Buds of May. I mean, you still got the shit beaten out of you at school, but in a posh accent. Yeah. And so anyway, I'd, I'd go running and there would be a mystical energy. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you're doing your meditation practice, that there is more energy around 
uh, that when there's sometimes mist that comes in and you go running by the sea and it's just, and I've always had that and it's never left me. 99% of heavy metal bands are boring. You know, 99% of anything is, is you know, it's, it's all right, you know, bless them and all that, but there's, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of meat there. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of imitation. There's a lot of posturing and this kind of thing. Originality is, um, it's rare. You know, I mean, even this. I know. I mean, pretty so I've been doing it 18 years. I have a super sensitivity towards the strength of the wind. You know, any, any, even just the tiniest movement of my ladder, I'm super sensitive towards it. Wow. So uh, I have faith in myself. It'll, it'll be okay. Do you However, know where the word spiritual comes from. Latin. No. Spiritus, spiritualis. It means a gust of air, a gust of wind, the breath of oh. life. Yeah. Spiritus. The mm. only thing I've ever translated that is more difficult than that was a dream diary by a guy called Aelius Aristides. And that's really weird because you've got talking bricks and f things, you know, really abstract. But philosophy, I would say, is the most difficult to translate because one sentence you'll sit and meditate upon that for a whole day uh, uh, egypt wise so uh well, <clears throat> basically the the um the greeks and the romans not all of them but many of them had a very disparaging view of magic there are a few notable exceptions plato is one in the mino he mentions having a spell that was able to cure someone of a hangover. And in one book, well, actually two books, um, he, he mentions that the Egyptian, he, he mentions Hermes Trismegistus, right? So that's that's important. Um, but he also mentions in another text that when he asked um, the Egyptian priests, they said that you Greeks are merely children. Egypt has been there much from a much more ancient time. And this is corroborated archeologically. And if you talk to Egyptian scholars, they have a much more forward thinking view of magic because the pyramid texts and many of the Egyptian books, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, for example, um, they are highly magical and they're, they're all to do with reincarnation and, and going through rituals, initiation rituals to prepare the soul for the afterlife, the fields of Amentep. And you even see a picture of Thoth, which is the Egyptian Hermes, weighing the souls of the dead on papyri. And and uh, by the way, uh, you said you were a, a Christian in the past, didn't you, before to me? Yeah, uh, a Christian henotheist. Yeah. A henotheist means someone that believes in the one. So I would believe in God. For me, it's Jesus Christ. For someone else, it might be Allah. Someone else, it might be Moses. Someone else could be a Taoist. Someone else could be a Wiccan. Someone could even be of any religion in the entire world. They could be Buddhist. But they, a henotheist believes in a hierarchy of angels. And a guy called Dionysius the Areopagite wrote about this. So did Thomas Aquinas. And they talk about thrones, powers, dominions, angels, archangels. And these come up in the Shem Ham Foresh especially. And there is a kind of spiritual hierarchy in the, the upper realms. So I don't just believe in God, although I do believe in God. I believe in a, a big huge cosmic order of subordinate spirits. I believe in all of them, every single one. Because in the now Georgievic Telemann MA, in his works, uh, he even speaks about this, um, that there are certain journals and copies of books, even in the Akashic records, there are copies of books that have long since been lost to the human world that the Shemham Forash and the Earth Zone spirits and the lunar zone spirits the saturnian spirits the venusian spirits the martian spirits and even the solar spirits they've kept the records and they keep the records and they even keep records of books that we're in the process of writing and these are living books i remember waking from a dream uh, just a few weeks ago i had this absolute certainty that like this is not the main event what we pass into uh, upon death, this relates to going through these processes of training to become more conscious, more solid upon death. The realm that we embark into upon death, that is the actual arena. 
and everything. I, I'm not the first person to say this, of course. It's, you know, it's, it's in the Hermetic writings. Yeah, but the you know your everything that you are, everything that you think, everyone that you've in, you've reacted with, like you said, every book. It's all there. You, ima- you imagine that, you, you know, you're on your deathbed and you struggled with all these things. You tried to make a name for yourself. And even in very noble ways, you know, you've tried to be a good person. Believe it or not, it goes back to ancient Egypt. Talk Egypt. OK, well, um, the, the pillars of Hermes, where the Hermetic writings were first kept, they weren't written in Greek. In Book 16 of the Corpus Hermeticum, there is a letter to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh replies and says, do not translate these into ancient Greek. You must keep them in the Egyptian hieroglyphs because we, our words have power. There weren't even any vowels in the Egyptian alphabet because they were considered so sacred that you couldn't even utter the ineffable names of the gods. They would invoke angels. Now, these pillars, the Egyptian priests, they knew that the flood was coming and that these writings would have to be preserved. So they carved them upon pillars. And these were spherical. They called them cylinders. And they buried them deep beneath the earth. And they knew everybody was going to die. They knew it. But they also knew what was going to happen in the future because they were magicians and they were very good diviners. So they knew how to survive the flood and how to resuscitate these texts, which they then would go down and survive. So it's only thanks to the ancient Egyptians that we have got a sort of secondhand uh, tradition that has come from ancient Egypt. Eventually there was a flood. And there is a very strange type of soil at the base of the Sphinx, which geologists still can't work out why the, the kind of soil is the, as it is. So there is definite evidence for a flood and there's an abundance of uh, literary evidence, not just from the classical world, but in par- uh, parallel texts in Mesopotamia and all sorts of places. And anyway, it eventually went through to Ptolemaic Egypt. Alexander the Great, you had uh, Alexandria, which is a very enlightened period. You had Christians and pagans living together a bit like the Abbasid Caliphate in the 10th, 11th century in Spain, where you had Jews and Christians and Muslims all sharing magical texts together and things like that. And so it eventually got handed down and handed down and handed down until it got to Constantinopolis, which was then taken over in 1453 by the the Moors and somebody smuggled the texts out, a guy called Leonardo de Pistoria into a monastery in Macedonia where it was then brought to Italy where the Medici family were acquiring a huge amount of manuscripts and that was when it was first translated into Latin. And Latin was the language of the intelligentsia and still is in a certain way um, that that was the first time that these texts really became widely accessible. So people like Isaac Casabon, who is what most of the scholarly world cling to, and they say, ah, this this can't be ancient. It's not ancient Egyptian because of the style of Greek that it was written in. And so he'll look at parallels from the first, second century AD and see other authors and the phrases they use. They say, ah, look, look, it's the same. But actually, no, read the remaining hermetic texts. And it says quite clearly, categorically, that they were written in Egyptian hieroglyphs. Even Iamblichus mentions this. When they are peaceful, so the soul also returns to its proper peaceful course. If the soul like to repay justice, then the soul also does the duty of the judge in the afterlife. If the soul was a musician, then the soul also sings in the afterlife. If the soul is a lover of truth, then the soul also devotes itself to philosophy. Indeed, it is almost necessary that these souls are appropriate to the way of their being, to see them, what they do love doing on earth. Because if they fell into humanity, the souls have forgotten their proper nature, and even more so for the souls which are further away. And in revenge, the souls remind themselves of the way of being of those things which had been locked away secret. So it's saying, if you're a window cleaner in life, or you work in Domino's, oh. like me, right, then you're going to end up working in Domino's for the rest of your life, so you better find another job. And that's what I've been trying to do. Now, I used to work as a, an actor on film sets. Now, it was a big Hollywood movie, and I had a speaking part. I was the only person in my town that got a speaking part because they'd talent spotted me, right? And um, 
at that time I was on the up and up. I had a big YouTube channel. I had 46,000 hits on one of my videos in the first 24 hours. That was Walk on the Wild Side by Lou Reed. It was my comedy take on it called Walk on the Mild Side. And it was just after I come off the road for 15 years. So I was on the top of my game because I've been a guitar player for 15 years. So I was bang on it. Anyway, so I had quite a few hits. I had like literally hundreds of thousands of hits. I got into a copyright dispute with Google over RCA Records from a, uh, a, um, a comedy thing we did with my old man of the, uh, uh, an old Doc Watson song that's over 100 years old. You're in the jailhouse now. And we had these like straw hats and uh, like fake teeth and uh, you're in the jailhouse now. And we got sued by like RCA Records, right? Yeah. So I just went on there and I just deleted all my videos and they got seriously pissed off with me, right? And I backed them up and I intended to upload them again, but my hard drive died. And ever since then now, I watch my hits go down. So like even these comedy ones, it'll go up to 191, then it'll go down. How, how can they go down? And it's the secret intelligence services. It's Google, big tech. They control who's popular and who's not. Because I maybe came across as a bit deranged or paranoid. I have studied computer science. When I was a kid, I wanted to write computer games. Right, That's what I wanted to do. Then I found my love of music and I, I just ended up becoming a musician. But when I was studying computer science at Weymouth College, we were understanding random numbers. And there's no such thing as a random number on a computer. There have been several uh, advances uh, recently and only in the past year or so um, where they are trying to get sort of random numbers, but it's like one of those wheels you get as a kid that you can type out people's names, that you turn the wheel round and you get, yeah? So they're pseudo random numbers. And if you go low enough into what's called machine code, which is a first generation programming language, or assembly, which is a second generation programming language that uses three letter acronyms or abbreviations they can drop down beneath the operating system and change the outcome of any number so it might not even be google's fault it probably is google's fault because they own youtube but what i'm saying is crypto the tor browsers it's all owned by the secret intelligence services the five eyes they were the ones that made it and they can change any number they want so they can change someone who goes from 460,000 hits, like I had, and they can take them down to two. Even though people watching it five minutes ago could see you have 46,000 hits. But if you piss these people off, they will just destroy your reputation and you will never become anybody. You will be a window cleaner for the rest of your life if there's anything they can do about it. And so it's not paranoia. It's a knowledge of computer science concluding an awesome interview thank you broderick it's been an honor and believe me it's so great to talk to you as well i've learned a lot today not just about wisdom and practice but also about myself